Welcome to the One Within All to the Universe podcast. I'm Chance. It's a great day when we can learn something new. And even better when that knowledge can connect and reflect with bigger picture truths that expand our worldview to include a more exciting and powerful story of ourselves and human potential. In the immortal words of Godfrey Higgins, in the affairs of religion, the world has always been in one respect the same as it is now. From the most remote period, there has been the esoteric religion the existence of which the vulgar rabble of low priests have denied, but which has always been well known and admitted by a select number, who wore the mitre. This was anciently observed by a few philosophers who occasionally showed some knowledge of it and endeavored to explain its nature to the people. For this endeavor, they were persecuted. And just what was that endeavor that led to the jailing of thinkers like the Reverend Robert Taylor or burning at the stake of a Giordano Bruno? It was the lifting of the veil from literal interpretations of religious mythology to demonstrate the cosmological and astrological science encoded in those traditions. Well, friends, we are blessed to live in a time where many layers of liberation have been achieved compared to centuries past, and our guest today has taken the torch of enlightenment and done the legwork to build up our understanding of star lore and astrotheology using modern technology and access to information to restore what's been lost without going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> the fingerprints of an ancient worldwide system, evidence of global cultural diffusion at a distant point of prehistory, and quite possibly a revealing of the depth of the collective human psyche through the archetypal patterns encoded in those twinkling little stars. Of course, who else could I be describing other than the great David Warner Matheson, author of the absolutely epic book series Star Myths of the World, Volumes 1 through 4, and The Ancient Worldwide System, along with quite a few other books. In prior episodes, David has shown us the Hercules Constellation's signature thunderbolt-wielding deity type, the many faces of Ophiuchus in mythology, and many other amazing asterism analyses. And since he's recently moved his life down under and is a newly and happily married man, I thought it'd be great for us to focus on some stellar stories that don't get much airtime in the synchromistic podcast circuits. What are the legends of aboriginals in Australia and Africa demonstrate about the ancient worldwide system? We'll take a deep dive into this lesser-known astral gnosis, and if we've got time for it, we might even visit China, India, or South America, too. Check out David Matheson's work at StarMythWorld.com, and if you're a serious researcher, do yourself a favor and start collecting these valuable books. They're a great read from cover to cover, or a fantastic resource to use as an astrotheological glossary, since you can just jump to a specific myth and get the gravy in any order you choose. Don't forget to hit up the show notes for this episode. For links to the full extended podcast and all the many ways you can support Interverse, big thanks to our many patrons and friends out there. And with that, the table set in this feast of knowledge is piping hot, so let's get into it. Everyone, please welcome star myth and all-around cool surfer guy, the great David Warner Matheson. Thanks for coming back on Interverse, man. Thanks, Chance. What a glowing introduction. I appreciate those kind words and it's great to be back. Looking forward to talking today and yeah, it sounds like you've been up to a lot of exciting things as well lately. Oh yeah. Always, always growing, man. 
And it, before we get into the the deep, deep stuff, you know, is there anything in terms of like life or world events that's kind of on your mind lately that might be through the lens of the David Matheson corollary? Well, that is a loaded question right there, Chance. We are living in interesting times, as they say. The uh, the old the old saying, "May you live in interesting times." Well, we're witnessing in many ways, and we don't need to spend the whole episode talking about this, but it's really related. We're witnessing the end or the shredding or the unraveling of much of what we've been used to assuming would never change of Western civilization and this Western dominance. Well, what is Western civilization? It's, it's this civilization that basically came from Western Europe. Well, what was Western Europe? The Western half of the Roman Empire when it broke in half. The Roman Empire was this pivot time between the ancient wisdom, the Romans worshipped the Roman gods and goddesses that they had. The Greeks worshipped the Greek gods and goddesses. And we, and we believe that we're descended from you know those civilizations, but really the Christian or the Judeo-Christian takeover of the Roman Empire, and then it turned into this literalist Christian entity right before it broke in half and then basically imploded into these fiefdoms of Western Europe. The Western half is Western Christianity that became basically feudalism, which is oligarchy, which is basically warlords lording it over the people and saying, we're better than you. So Western civilization is based on a form of elitism that says some people are divinely kings and nobles and everyone else has to serve them. And so they basically just sit around and, you know, take the the produce of the land for themselves because they are God's, you know, appointed nobles. Well, that, well, how did they get appointed? It's because they uh, they claim descendants from the sons of Noah. <laughs> Usually, it's something like that. And then, you know, we're we're in an age now where we can finally talk about how actually that's all allegory, and uh, there's you know, it's controversial, but right. there's right. no such it thing is. as a, a Shemite because Shem is a fictional character. So you know, maybe that's we right. should get our our heads wrapped around like the origins of this authority system being. Not, not the pillars of uh, strength that they used to be claimed to be. You know, well, and and so what we're seeing in in the there's just extreme violence and um, lashing out going on the Ukraine, um, you know, situation where they're now attacking into Russia with American weapons. The situation in Israel, which is a creation of the British Empire, which is you know an heir to this whole tradition of the Western elitism, the things that they did in Africa, we're going to talk about some African myths, the things that the European colonists did in Africa are just horrific, including the Jesuit reductions that they set up, which is like a reduction camp. I mean, it sounds awful. You get, you know, forced into labor and taught literalist Christianity and stripped of all your traditions. And this was happening in Guinea and, you know, West Africa and Nigeria. We're going to talk about some myths from the people of modern day Nigeria, Yoruba land or Yor- the Yoruba. But the this Western civilization that is basically, what I'm trying to show is that it is based on this elitism or this artificial elitism that overthrew the ancient system and said, Oh no, we've got something different and better. And so we can go around stamping out other people's traditions and and received traditions by saying, Oh no, you're all this is all false. We're gonna teach you the true religion and and our way is the right way because we're Christian and you're not. That whole system is now imploding because if you build a system based on basically non 
<laughs> non-production, just siphoning off other people's resources and labor, eventually that is going to collapse. And that's what's happening. The, the Western Europe has thrown all of its weapon systems into Ukraine and gotten spanked by Russian systems. The Russian systems, because Russia hasn't sat on its butt, you know, doing nothing. Uh, I'm going a little far afield, but the the economies of China and Russia and the so-called third world are now outproducing economies that are based on just kind of grift in Wall Street. You know, well, I can just take I can just take the resources or the production of other people, just like the feudal lords did in the medieval times. The the financial if you listen to Michael Hudson, Professor Michael Hudson, explain the history of finance, basically the bank system, the Wall Street system is the direct heir of that whole system of feudal lords sitting around and lording it over everyone else. And so the Western GDP is supposedly so large, but that's just based on inflated real estate prices and, and inflated financial stuff that doesn't actually produce goods and services and it doesn't actually produce modern weapon systems you've got just a corrupt facade that's now falling down and it's it's really it's really a shocking thing to see but in a sense this is like it was all built on a lie to begin with and now that lie is starting to unravel and it's and it's violent in its unraveling if that if that was yeah. coherent you no, know, it, it is, you know, and I think that it's uh, we, the the solution is embedded in the problem. So the problem is these kind of like dark alchemy versions of an economy where you're converting <laughs> lead to gold in the form of imaginary value placed on paper and now placed on numbers and digits in a, you know, in a digital system that have no real reflection of some kind of real world value anymore. And there's just layers and layers of fiction wrapped up in itself with the derivatives and the stocks and the et cetera, and like people speculating on, on who's going to pay their debts or who's not. And the casino is, uh, you know, it's on fire. And the solution is very easy. Like it seems very, it seems quite scary if maybe you've got a lot invested in, in the fiction, but at any time, all you have to do is tap back into the unlimited resources of the very land that we're a part of, you know? So the solution is in the problem. Get back to reality. Get away from the the fictional systems. Get out of debt the best you can. Don't take on more debt if you can help it. And just make real value, real resources. Make more people, stuff like that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you brought up like the, the Africa situation and how the colonists did the same thing in India, too. Um, and that's still going on. It's just now under the guise of rather than being run by Jesuit priests or what have you, the depopulation is through World Health Organizations and things of that nature under the, the pseudo, you know, help and, and medicine lens. But yeah, it's uh, I think we're on the same page with all that. It's it's interesting to watch the, the show, but I try to just focus on the good, true and beautiful, man. And there's no fear. Well said. Well, and the myths of the world that unite the people of the world, this whole fiction that one set of stories is true while the rest are false is wrong. And we can prove that it's wrong. And we'll see some evidence a little bit today, but we've talked about it in other uh, visits that we've had together. That fiction is, um, you know, it's demonstrably a false premise that one set of stories is right while all the other are false. But they're all teaching the same thing, and it's pointing towards what you're talking about, that we have the power within us. It's not external. It's not that you have to believe in some external supposed historical figure who lived some number of thousands of years ago. And if you believe in that historical, you know, you have to buy into the, a literal external savior. That's actually not what the stories are about. It's not, they're not about that. They're about what is going on inside, which is, you know, pointed to by the very title of your show, Innerverse. It's all inside. 
it's all inside in some sense that the myths are trying to tell us this is important. They're telling you this is important. And so those traditions of the Africa, North America, Central America, South America, Australia, we think of those cultures, what it's a type of a shamanic, uh, I know that word gets overused, but it's a, it's a valuable word for describing a worldview. When I say a shamanic worldview, we can kind of understand what I'm talking about, even though that's a term that comes from the Altaic region of actually modern day Russia. The, the word shaman describes those practices in, you know, the Russian uh, past. Hundreds of years ago, there were shamans in, in Russia. But that term, when you say shaman, I know it gets overused, but you can understand when I say a Native American shaman or an African shaman or an Australian, because that, that is the same worldview. And actually, there's a very interesting writer. I'm well, happy. Uh, you can call it Gnostic too, because sha sure. in that dialect means to know. So a shaman in the Ooh. original language it's from is one who knows. So we're, we're talking about Gnosticism. <laughs> yeah, well, I love how you've got that. Um, you always bring in these linguistic angles on it. And what I was going to say is I'm reading this interesting author named Peter Kingsley. I've read some of his other books before and written blog posts about him even years ago, decades ago. I think a reader, um, a friend through email started me on the path of reading Peter Kingsley. And he's writing, all his books are pointing to the Greek philosophical tradition was absolutely shamanic, but it was hijacked and turned into and drained of all its shamanism. And he's writing this, this book that I'm reading right now is called Reality. It's about Parmenides, who is credited with being the father of philosophy in ancient Greece. He left us this poem, and the poem describes him going to the underworld to meet with the goddess who imparts some words to him. That is a shamanic, this is where Peter Kingsley is explaining, that is a shamanic expression. It's a shamanic approach. And yet modern philosophers basically throw out all the parts of his poem that say he's going to the underworld to meet a goddess. And they say, well, that's just, you know, that's just a, a convenient um, little frame that he wanted to put on. We can just ignore that. Let's just get to the meaty parts. No, that's what he's saying is it's all shamanic. Our Western roots in ancient Greece or ancient Egypt where the, you know, the gods and goddesses of all the different cultures is a shamanic approach. It's been hijacked and drained and turned into something that it's not. Um, but this is all what I'm going to talk about today showing it's not just a mind exercise. This, these, the fact that these stories are based on the stars has profound significance to us. I'm going to try and, you know, we'll try and flesh that out during our conversation, but that it's exactly what you're saying. It's, it's Gnostic, it's shamanic, it's, but it's been lost or it's been, we've been, it's been papered over with something that's anti-shamanic, if you will, because certainly the, you know, Judeo-Christian Europeans went around stamping out shamanism wherever they found it, including in you know, the Northern European countries had shamans who used drums when the Christians from the, you know, lower <laughs> Southern parts of Europe finally got up to like Norway and Scandinavia. The first thing they did was take away all the drums and burn them. And that was these, more these, uh, than anything else was get rid of the drums. <laughs> these like Imperial Christians you're describing are about as Christian as a David Soros is Jewish, you know, like, I see a really big parallel with stuff going on right now where a particular, you know, label is used as kind of like an identity liability shield for people. <laughs> and it's like a claim to victimhood. I mean, how much do you hear about the the Romans persecuting the Christians and how, you know, oh, poor, poor them. The Romans were throwing them to the lions. But in the, the actual codices of Roman law, there's not a single word or a single law against Christians. And there's actually stuff that supports their right to do what they want to do. And, and things like, you know, the 
supposed madness of Nero and all of that can be demonstrated to be sourced from artifacts that are not uh, they're not of the antiquity that they're claimed to be. And in fact, could be called forgeries. So I, I see like a, a kind of repeating cycle of of uh, this offer of victimhood. That is your excuse to not live up to your potential or, you know, why you're something external you can point to to why your life is bad. And in that sense, the external savior and the, the devil uh, concept are required for each other. You know, again, I'll quote Godfrey Higgins, no devil, no priests. <laughs> you can't have one without the other. But I've been OK. So for a long time, you know, I've been interested in the star myth stuff and I've always gone back to this one question, trying to root myself into the ancient past and think to my think what what who would I have to be to develop this complex system of allegory out of stars and to put these stories up there that reflect nature and reflect the human psyche so beautifully that it's like beyond to the point where on a like John McHugh research point, they eventually start developing layers and layers of their mythology just out of the the wordplay context within what was our what was established in previous ages so it's like some somehow what's up there and the way that we interpret it has continual evolution that brings further and further wisdom that's up to date to the time in which we're looking at it so how does this happen how did they get established in the first place and i know that you do a lot of like you know, considering of the the depth psychology angle, young and archetypes and all that. Actually, your newest book seems to be about that. I just haven't had a chance to get into it yet. And when you get into Young's expanded framework, it really opens the door as to whether there's a greater and more comprehensive mind that acts upon this principle of association by similarity. And like that there's that the the collective mind somehow operates on this correspondence and pattern system. And in fact, our intelligence is b- built upon that ability to construct correspondences in things that we observe outside of us to things that we observe inside of us. That's the framework for intelligence to exist in the first place, in my opinion. And so if there's layers to our psyche and unconscious and ego consciousness, et cetera, that, and we understand the, the mental nature of our reality, whether through experience or because it's just more philosophically sound to postulate that consciousness is primary rather than matter producing consciousness and that all matter is object in consciousness then of course the the world itself would have to have these type of layers the same way that our psyche has these layers including potentially un unknown or hidden realms if you will that the ultimate map of nature is the map of the psyche that depth psychology demonstrates so this psyche takes precedence over physics in terms of a, a description of the universe that's accurate. And back to Jung, I mean, he talks about the greater part of the soul existing outside of the body and using this description to help us understand the meaningful coincidences that we call synchronicity and that the secret symmetries between consciousness and matter are evident whenever you understand that, you know, what's out there is what's in here. So with all that, you know, on the table, I'm thinking there that those stars out there, those are like that's the permanent, the permanent deep collective psyche. You know, it's the the most primal and real and original part of ourself. It might as that dome that we see over our head might as well be our own skull that we're looking at from the inside of it. I hope all that makes sense, but that's the way I want to set the table for getting into this star myth and trying to understand. You know, it, it's interesting to think cultural diffusion. It's interesting to think that this is stuff that's just innate within us. I see most likely that it's like a little bit of A and a little bit of B. But, you know, maybe we should get into it. I'm I'm fired up, though. I love talking about this stuff. Yeah, fascinating points you're raising there, Chance. I would say for sure you would pro not probably, you would be interested in this book, Reality by Peter Kingsley. And he has some interviews and conversations you can listen to on various podcasts where he does discuss Jung and uh, recently translated writings from Jung, uh, kind of a more recent, the Red Book or something like that. But um, I'm not a, uh, I'm saying check it out. You'll, you'll enjoy it because those very questions that you're bringing up are 
explored in this book, reality. And so now where did it come from and what is Dave even talking about? I'll show some slides in just one second, but that, you know, this external, this internal, how did, how did we get it? I'm convinced that there is a part of each of us that, you know, this new age term higher self has been watered down and overused and, but I'm now starting to call it eternal self because time is change, but time is also, as we know, in a sense, an illusion because at any given moment, there's only what now you're always in now. And it circles back around. I mean, the cyclical nature of it gives the eternality of, of non-change. It's like a, a weird paradox. That's right. It's so there is non-change in eternity. Eternity is non-change. And, and, um, there's a, a metaphor from Laird Scranton. I didn't put the picture up on my screen because I didn't know I was going to talk about it, but Laird Scranton, who studied the Dogen, says the Dogen tell us that there are seven sets of universes. Each set has a sister pair that is the eternal side or the, you know, the, the invisible side and the visible side, the material side. The, 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 the. So there's 14 universes, but the eternal, this is what Laird Scranton said, is like if you set up a movie camera over the streets of, say, Los Angeles during rush hour, you'll see all the cars, and let's say it's you know evening and it's getting dark. You'll see all the cars, the headlights, the taillights as they're in bumper-to-bumper traffic, little you know atoms or molecules moving along the freeway. But then if you take that film home and speed it up on your, you know, your editing software, basically all the cars will become lines. They will all become, you know a trail of white and red lines from their headlights and taillights going from their start to their finish. And where are they at any given moment in eternity? They're the whole thing. They're at the beginning and at the end. In time, they're at the point. So like what you just said, there is no beginning. And in eternity, the car is a wave. But in time, the car is a point that's stuck in traffic. Well, we have, we are here in time. We're under the heavens. The turning of the heavenly bodies gives us the time. The ancients talked about Saturn gives the measures. He's the Lord of time. He's just, you know, it's a planet that's circling the um, sun in a 29 and a half or 30 year approximate cycle that is giving out the measures. Our time is measured in the turning of the earth, the rising and the motion of all these things. The moon gives us months and, you know, you're, Wife's expecting a child. If you ask, as I did when I was talking to the Iroquois about their creation myths, and they said, what's this 40, 40, 40? How come 40 shows up so much? And I said, well, how long is a baby's gestation? Well, the answer is 40 weeks. So it's 40 weeks. That 40, Alvin Boyd Kuhn says, that 40 that you find throughout the myths as being so important has to do with gestation of coming into this world. But the Native American woman who was running the seminar said immediately, 10 moons, 10 moons. That, they, know that, they know the gestation period of a baby as 10 moons because a moon is four weeks. So 40 weeks, they said, well, it's clearly 10 moons. That's how long a baby. So we measure time by these cycles, these heavenly cycles. But also in a sense, we're both in time and yet in eternity. So where did all these amazing things come from? If we all have a piece of us that's connected to an eternal self that knows the whole thing, knows the whole wave of the car on its commute, is not caught up in its, you know, the bumper to bumper traffic and the stops and the starts and the arguments and the road rage, is just a wave. That part of us can see the whole and is, in a sense, outside of time and above it. We have to live here in time and yet. We're given this amazing gift of eternal self, which has characteristics. And the myths demonstrate this. I'm I'm actually running an online live course right now um, for people who already signed up for it. It's halfway through, but where we talk about recognizing and trusting eternal self and how the myths point to that. So all your intro, fantastic. That's what I believe these star myths are pointing to us, something profound, something 
It's not just a crossword puzzle, an intellectual exercise. Oh, which ex- which myth, which which character matches up with these constellations? It's teaching us something deep that's hard to grasp, but that's powerful and relates to exactly what you said. It's all also inside in some way. Everything out there, even as far away as Jupiter and all the stars behind it, is also somehow in there. Just like the dome, like you said, the dome of the heavens is right there in your skull and you're living in it. You can't get out of it. You're in, you're in time, but you're also in eternity. Mm, it's hard to under, it's hard to grasp, but these myths are trying to show it to us. So, and the, the last thing slides when you're, when you're, when you're ready, go ahead. Well, yeah, let's do that. But, uh, you know, the thing that I left out when I was talking about this, like depth psychology, the collective consciousness is the map of reality of, of the universe. I, you know, I started by asking that question of like, who would I have to be to come up with this system of correspondence, the star myth? And uh, part of me chasing down the potential answers to that question has had me looking at like the contact experiencers, non-human intelligences, fairy folklore, things where people are like getting levitated out of their bed and phased through walls. And sometimes there's multiple witnesses and it sounds all so fantastic. But if you take these people's accounts at their word and you take at their word, the athletes who say things like in a three or four second play in football, I feel like I have three or four minutes to choose who to pass the ball to these transcendental capabilities of the human, especially in regards time, because in those contact experiences, many times there's missing time where they, their experience feels like days and they were gone 10 minutes or, or vice versa. It feels like 10 minutes and they were gone days. Teleported to another continent sometimes. Like these accounts are out there in mass along with NDE reports and all kinds of other transcendental things. So my point being like you, you're saying there's something deeper about this star lord besides just a, an academic exercise to figure out the puzzle, which is fun. It is fun. But what it's pointing to is those transcendental ca- capabilities of the human being that would be necessary to even create such a, a mythos, you know? And that's, what's exciting about it to me. Like who, what, the more you pull the thread, the more you see how everything connects to everything. It's so exciting. Like, whoa, we, and in looking at the scriptures and stuff, like people wrote this stuff, people created this stuff. And, and we're over here like, man, it's hard to write, uh, a regular 2024 book. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to put that on the table, you know, like this is, our, this is our superpowers, man. Great points. No, we all have experience moments where we think of someone and then they call later that day and we haven't talked to them in years or these kinds of things that the modern materialist religion or science or whatever you want to call it, this modern paradigm that has been drilled into us says, None of that is real. All of that is coincidence. All, you know, synchronicities are just coincidence. The ancient worldview is there is an eternal realm, an invisible realm, a realm of, um, sometimes it's called the realm of the dead, like Hades or the Duat in ancient Egypt. But that's really, it's the unseen realm because we have myths of characters going to the realm of the dead all the time. Odysseus goes to the realm of the dead. Orpheus goes to the realm of the dead. The hero twins, Hunapu and Ishbalanke of the Maya Popol Vuh, go to the underworld. They go to the realm, going to the realm of the dead. is the first the UFO witness of modern reports, the guy that the flying saucer phrase came from, says that he... And it's not reported as often, but he says he thought that what he saw came from the place where we go when we die. You know, like this is, it's part of the lore. That's why I'm, I bring it up because it's like, it's all connected. It's very interesting. So that realm is real and is here. It's connected. We are, we're, it's touching us. It's not really two realms. It's not a, di- it's not a dichotomy. We're, it's, it's here at every, we're in the hour. spirit world right now. This is that's the spirit right. world. That's there's exactly it. That's right. So, so that's what one thing that they're showing us is that truth. 
and it impacts our life. You just mentioned some, you know, examples from high level athletes. Like these sorts of things have real application. Well, in Greek times, high level athletes was called you're in battle. And instead of losing a basketball game, you're going to lose your life if you don't perform at your highest. So you want to, you want to be, um, in touch with that part of you that is connected to eternal. And I call that eternal self. And it is real. It's as real as anything else, you know, that you can, you know, knock your hand against your table. The diamond. It's, it's real. Yeah, that's right. The, so, um, it, it's real. It has real practical application for our life. It's, um, it's we're just there. At the infancy with, of, we're at the infancy of accessing it, you know, especially it, it, when you comprehend that that eternal self is an infinite reservoir of energy and wisdom and love, you know, like and it's been given to us. Yeah. It's, it's, we've, we've, wherever these star myths come from, they're very ancient. They're worldwide. They were given to every culture on earth. We've been given the keys to these profound things that we're talking about. And yet there is a force out there trying to stamp it out or trying to um, divert it or pervert it or twist it. Peter Kingsley talks about how, you know, philosophy was turned into kind of a parlor exercise, a parlor trick, a, just a crossword puzzle, a splitting of hairs. But really, it's about something much deeper. But we've been told that it's, oh, it's just about, a, you know, deep thought, uh, uh, mind games, uh, logic exercises. No, that's not what it's about at all. And so there's a, there's a force out there that's almost um, battling this wisdom for some strange reason that because it doesn't want people empowered. I mean, look, Michael has, I'll go back to well, Michael. The psycho, a, like the depth psychology view on that would be it, these external forces that do this repression and obfuscation are the manifestation of our own personal sort of repression way. of our own higher potential. And so well yep, that means that, that, and so that means that whatever these external forces of, of evil or repression or, or lies are that they're, their reach into your life only goes so far as the amount that you self repress, you know, and that's it brings us full circle to what we were saying at the beginning, how you see all this crazy turbulence in the world, but the solutions are always there for the person, the individual that doesn't have to be swept up in all that, but we, <laughs> we better get to the slides, yeah, man. I mean, this is, slide, this is fun really? though. I mean, I'm glad we got this warm up because well, that's why we need to talk yeah. more often. <laughs> you asked what I thought about the, Events of the world around us are, they're changing very rapidly. We are living in historic times. And I was going to say, Michael Hudson actually traces the overthrow of the ancient economic systems to the more recent Greeks, the classical Greeks, not the ancient Greeks, not the, the Greeks that are being described kind of in the Homeric epics, but there was a later development of overthrowing that order. And he talks about, the, it was the overthrowing of an order that forgave debt. The, if you look in the scriptures, it's all about forgiving of debt and a, a periodic forgive, cancellation of debts so that oligarchs don't arise. And basically what Michael Hudson says is oligarchy arose kind of during the period of the Athenians. And, and the Athenians and the Spartans were saying, hey, that's horrible. We have to stop that. And yet we hold up in modern civilization, the Athenians as, oh, they're the glorious start of Western civilization. Yeah, maybe they're the start of the Western civilization that is an oligarchical um, rejection of the ancient order. And the mythological imperialism of that, that version of Greek culture reflected just the same in the mythological imperialism, imperialism of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Where they precisely they take the yeah. myths of the world and claim them as their own and ob obscure the origins of those myths and precisely make the uh, invalidate everybody else's version of the truth. Yeah, precisely. And in, in the the texts of the Bible talk all about forgiveness of debts, and yet that is the exact opposite of what you know literalist Christianity generally does on an economic basis. The first sermon of Jesus, Michael Hudson points this out. He 
you know, I think it's all metaphor, but he opens up a text that says, I've come to proclaim the forgiveness of debts, the setting free of prisoners, the Rosetta Stone, the ancient Egyptian Rosetta Stone is a, is a text that talks about forgiving of debts, all these things. Anyway, if you want an oligarchy, you don't forgive debts. You want to bind people and take away their wealth and their power and keep them down. So I think this is all connected. It's on an internal level. It's on a societal level. These myths are speaking both to personal recovery and societal, basically um, getting rid of oligarchy. What you've got going is um, oligarchy has reached almost a, its terminal phase and is imploding around, r- around us. And the media doesn't really want us to realize the full significance of what's going on. It is a major stuff going on in the world right now. So all that said, I'm ready to hear right. screen and go to slides whenever you're ready, Chance. Let's do it, man. And yeah, bring bring on the collapse of oligarchy. I'm <laughs> right. I'm in for it because like if you know we're we're anti fragile when we're connected to the truth. When we know that what we're sustained by is the the source and singularity of all life, and that we're no different than a a bird in the sense that what we need is always present in our environment and accessible, and that's just like that the nature of truth like can't be hit. Um, can only be obscured, but it's always there. And same comes, same goes for our sustenance and abundance. But yeah, you bring up the slides and I'll, I can see down in your window and I'll put them on screen. And uh, people that are just listening right now, good time to maybe bounce over to YouTube or Odyssey or Rockfin or, or Rumble. Lots of options to see the, the video side of this talk, but we'll do our best to describe it verbally too. Awesome. Well, thanks. You know, I, I love these conversations because sparks are flying, you know, in my mind, new new thoughts. I don't know if you're hearing the crows outside. I'm in Australia and the crows here have a real like, wah, wah. Yesterday I was backing up my car and I felt like the crow was laughing at my, I was backing into a parking space and I was maybe a little crooked and there was a crow outside going, wah, wah, wah. they really sound exaggerating different than crows in North America. But we will, I mentioned that because we'll talk about a a myth that involves a crow um, in an Australian Aboriginal um, story, sacred story. Some of these stories are discussed in one of the books that you mentioned, Ancient Worldwide System, where I go through myths from around the world. And this was really an update of Star Myths of the World, Volume 1. Back in 2016, I thought I was going to write a book just called Star Myths of the World, and I was going to cover all the myths, including the Bible and Greece. And, and I soon realized there's no way that I'm going to cover all these uh, myths in one volume. And later I had to write one whole volume on Greek myths, one whole volume on the Bible. And later I went back and revised volume one, which was trying to go through multiple cultures. I talk about stories from Japan, China. India. These books are huge, people. Like it's yeah. uh it's a high value for your dollar. Just want to say that. Like <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Chance. So this is a rewrite, an expanded, updated version of volume one where it, I I expanded the chapters on India became chapter on the Mahabharata, chapter on, you know, the different avatars of Vishnu. So it's nine hundred and sixty some pages, I believe, is ancient worldwide system. It's nine hundred and Nine, it's more than 900 pages, this one. But some of the stories that I'll Don't let that about, scare you, though, people, because you can just pick and choose the myths right. you want to read. You don't have to go through it all in order to get it. No, it's kind of like a, a encyclopedia. But I'm trying to show the connections to the stars. And as, as I've gone through, I've learned more. So I had to also update some of the things. This was published in 2019. And since then, I've written a, a couple more. So... Uh, I just bring that up because this myth and some of the others that I'll be showing are discussed in this particular volume. And I wanted to start, you had asked, hey, Dave, since you've moved to the Southern Hemisphere, what can you tell us about stories from the Southern Hemisphere? And I thought I'd actually start with Africa because Africa lies largely in the Southern Hemisphere, although it's such a huge continent that it goes also above the equator. And there is a deity from, I mentioned earlier, the Yoruba, or Yoruba 
people of Western part of Africa, modern day Nigeria. This is one of the largest people groups, the Yoruba. Um, and they have a God, they have gods and goddesses who are called Orisha, or I don't know if I'm exactly pronouncing it the way if I, you know, grew up in Yoruba culture, would pronounce it. But the Orisha are the deities, the, the gods and goddesses. And one of the most powerful central gods is Shango. And that name is spelled in different ways. You'll sometimes see it with an X. In fact, the word Django or Django Unchained, you know, the Tarantino movie, um, Django, I'm sure is that same, uh, you know, linguistically the same name, just like we're all named after gods and goddesses, basically. Or, or so there's a Roman figure. version of this deity too, named uh, Sh- Sankus or Shankus. Mm. So it's that, it's that same word, like Shango is the same as the idea of something that's sank, like sanctity, mm. sanctified, the same, yeah. philologically the same thing. Alvin Boyd, Kuhn, Alvin Boyd Kuhn even argues that the word Ankh, you know, of ancient Egypt, Ankh, uh, that, that sound of Ankh is um, almost worldwide uh, a sacred um, signifier. And our words king and queen also, Alvin Boyd Kuhn argues, are related to this same kind of... Um, uh, yeah, like in phil- philology, you could take that the X that's at the beginning, and that could be more of like a, it could be used like an H as the letter. And then some, some culture, like the Greeks, for example, they don't really like the aspirate, so they might drop it entirely. And now you just got onk, you know, and you mm-hmm. get G's and K's interchange or G's and C's. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I love the philology lens to see. <laughs> that's part of what shows you the worldwide nature of this stuff. It really does. And so let's look at a few characteristics. This is a carving of Shango from Africa. You can see that he is a god. He's a powerful looking god for starters. He is a fire god. I chose a nebula to put behind him. That's actually a nebula uh, photograph, but it looks like fire. He's a fire god. His weapons, sometimes a cudgel, but more commonly an axe. And you can see a couple of axes kind of planted right in the ground in front of him and even an axe coming out of the top of his head. So this square shaped head It's almost like the top of his head is flat. That is, you see that in Tiki's or, you know, the god Tiki or Tiki. um, And also a full beard to emphasize a square shaped head. So you probably already I know what constellation this is. You're probably already thinking of who this could be. But I want to show um, from ancient worldwide system, if you go to page 71, I talk about Shango and his one of his wives is Oya, his favorite wife, the most powerful goddess that he consorts with is Oya. And she's an interesting goddess that I explore a little bit in the book too. But if you look down at this description, it's from a book that was published in 1980 by a researcher named William Bascom, who lived from 1912 to 1981. So he was, you know, researching almost in the, you know, early years of the 20th century. And he talks about Shango and says, Shango is a god of thunder. Living in the sky, he hurls thunderstones to earth, killing those who offend him or setting their houses afire. His thunderbolts are prehistoric stone celts or Celts, which farmers sometimes find while hoeing their fields. They are taken to Shango's priests, who keep them at his shrine in a plate supported by an inverted mortar. Well, that's interesting. What is a mortar? We'll talk about that in a second. Just ask yourself that question, which also serves as a stool where the heads of initiates are shaved. So they sit on this inverted mortar when they, if you want to become devoted to the god Shango, um, and I guess you shave your head as an initiate, you get your head shaved while you're sitting on top of an inverted mortar. That's interesting. The stones in Shango's sacrifices may be an allusion to his thunderbolts sacrifices. And in one verse, Shango kills a leopard by putting an inverted mortar over it. He was noted for his magical powers. So all this that we're talking about, you know, going into connection with the eternal also has to do with spells, words. You're talking about word connections, sound healing, rhythm. There, there are ways of going into kind of trance that involves using kind of sing song chanting. You see it even in an auctioneer. I think we've talked about this before. An auctioneer, when he's putting you into a trance to buy something, he goes, Hey, who's going to buy that? And, same thing in a charismatic church where the preacher starts getting people into a trance condition. He'll start going, 
Um, they never they're, thought they're, of that with auctioneers, dude. That's so funny. Yeah, they're it's real. Entrancing the, they're entrancing the money right out of your wallet. <laughs> Off your money goes to buy. Yeah, a, just go, you know, go cow. try it out. Do a uh, shamanic journey work. I'm sure you can just search that phrase like shamanic journey and maybe do a little reading about what to do. And you just need like a drum or rattle track and and some quiet alone time. And you can go on a inner world journey and meet spirit animals or guides, all kinds of stuff. It's it's uh, amazing how that like the principles of like rhythm, coherent rhythm can alter consciousness without any need for a substance. Absolutely. So he's a god of magic. It says he's noted for magical powers, was feared because when he spoke, fire came out of his mouth. One verse has Shango lighting a fire in his mouth with a tufu, oil soaked fibers from the pericarp of the oil palm, which is used in making torches, starting fires in a state of possession. I didn't put the next page, but it says in a state of possession, those who are possessed by Shango can, it's said, eat fire or um, handle live coals without being burned, things like that walk across fire so and and those things are real and there are you can go to there's a japanese mountain god who's on top of a mountain who is a thunder god and when you go on these journeys into the mountains they have fire walking in japan still to this day that that god is called zao gongen maybe they're maybe you're gonna argue for a, a linguistic connection there too i don't know but um there are connections around the world but what i wanted to show this Algon would be an anagram for Shango. Like it's the sure. same, le- it's the same letters, just slightly different order. It's, uh, it's fascinating. I didn't think of that. Um, until just as we're talking, these are, this is how like getting as more people get together and then we talk, then more sparks fly off. It becomes greater than the sum of the parts. But what I want to show is, and this relates to what we were talking about. So I thought it was very important that we get to this right up front. These are dancers. And they're doing this specific dance that is associated with Shango or Shango or Django, or sometimes it's spelled Chongo. Look at their posture. Look at the dance moves. You can see the dancer in the top. He's holding an axe. We saw that an axe is a weapon of Shango, but look at his posture, a deep lunge, highly raised knee. His tongue is sticking out. And that is a characteristic around the world associated with the constellation that you already know what it is. We're going to get to it in one second, but there's dancers down at the bottom. If you search YouTube for Shango dance, you will find these. I'll show you the one. Uh, well, there's the constellation. So <laughs> I, I got it down below also where you can find that dancer at the top. The deep, powerful moves. Hercules, the constellation. When I saw, when people go into a trance in, this is like Santeria. So uh, Santeria is um, Caribbean, right? Cari- do, do, are you familiar with Santeria, Chance? I mean, I know of it, I'll say. Yeah, it's a, so it's like, you know, voodoo. Um, it's the Caribbean. So a lot of the Yoruba from Nigeria, region of Africa, were enslaved during colonial times by the Spanish, the British, the Portuguese, and brought to Cuba in the Isles of the Caribbean for making sugar cane there. And they also made sugar cane plantations in Equatorial Guinea and Nigeria, where they enslaved the people and made them work. And so there's a Yoruba diaspora where they've been taken around the world. It's a very large um, people group, the Yoruba. And so there's a lot of Shango and other Orisha um traditions that persist in the Caribbean to this day. And when you, when they play the rhythms and sometimes people start dancing, they will actually manifest a certain recognizable deity where others can say, Oh, Shango has taken him or her or a different, there's different dances. When you do this dance, then the people around you can know, Oh, okay. Shango. So when I saw that, I was just fascinated because this god is clearly associated with Hercules and the dance that people do in honor of Shango or when possessed by Shango reflects the constellation. I mean, we could stop the whole podcast right there and just talk about that or think about that. That's it. It's like, what's going on? 
even our movements reflect the stars. This is a God who we see his characteristics. I'll show for sure that Shango is associated with Hercules. If you don't believe it yet, you'll believe it in a minute. But the dance is associated with Hercules. In other words, what's out there in the sky, millions of miles away or light years away, can also take over you. Shango can be in you when you do this dance or when you're dancing and you're possessed by the spirit of Shango. You can have Shango in you. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It's like it's always been a part. Yeah, that's that's always been a part of the the esoteric tradition, like whether it's putting on a mask or, you know, it's other forms of rite and ritual. Yeah, I think that I think that your new book is about this, how yeah. what we're being yeah. taught through the the mystery school traditions and various world mythologies is that we have the power to access the various archetypes of the collective consciousness through the symbolic and ritualistic or ceremonial um, connections of, of taking, like, you know, taking a symbolic action that relates to whatever the archetype is that you want to evoke. It's very, it, it sounds kind of like out there, but just think how people would treat you if you dressed like a doctor. Or if you dressed like, you know, how like most professions have a costume <laughs> and and just what what you're wearing changes how you feel, how you interact with people like that's kind of the the most mundane version of this. And you can take it to quite an extreme level where, you know, you would you could call it possession or you could call that call it that you're just, ta you know, clicking on the the desktop icon in your psyche for a particular program to run. And the way that you open that program is by putting on the trappings or doing the movements or whatever the case may be. There's lots of ways to get there. And uh, that's that's huge. I think that's that's huge because so many of so many of humanity are kind of like locked into this narrow bandwidth of what they believe their personality to be or their potential to be. But we got the whole <laughs> you're not a chapter. You're the whole book. You're not a Zodiac sign. You're the entire Maseroth. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? The gods are in you. It's exactly the, the way I describe it is the gods are in you. Are they out there somewhere too? Yes. That they're, I mean, the distinction is almost irrelevant. It, it, um, yes, they're in you. They're, they're in the invisible realm, the divine realm, but they're also in you. And it's, this may sound very, like very out there, like you said, but you're right. You're absolutely right. I, I've experienced, I'll just give you one example. When you were saying that about, you know, taking on the persona can actually be real. When I was in the 82nd Airborne, I was a jump master. I went to jump master school, which is a very hard course. You have to find malfunctions and, um, you know, they deliberately rig up people's parachutes wrong. Not that the person's going to jump, but you have to inspect all these people and find all the errors to become a jump master, you got to find accurately all the major malfunctions and minor malfunctions that are rigged into these jumpers so that you can inspect people and make sure that their parachute's actually going to work. And on jumps, big mass tactical jumps where you've got hundreds of paratroopers, all I was a jump master, you know, inspecting people's gear. And I remember this one, it was like a young private, probably an 18 year old guy. And he's like, jump master. He comes up to me. I'm the jump master. He's like, jump master, I can't get this wire to go in he was trying to put the pin back in his he pulled out the pin that goes to the the handle of part of his gear his main parachute or his reserve parachute and i'm like give me that bro and i just like put it right there he was like he couldn't do it he, he was like oh, i'll go to a jump master a jump master but and just without any doubt i just grabbed it and went <laughs> there fixed it's like it worked for me it wouldn't work for him. Why? I don't know. Because he felt like scared. <laughs> probably, probably like, I don't like jumping <laughs> out of airplanes. I'm, you know, maybe he was brand new. I don't know how many jumps he'd had. But he's like, I'll go to the jump master. Jump master will fix it. Yep. Boom. And it was like, afterwards, I was like, wow, that was weird. It was like, I I didn't have any doubt in myself. I just, because I had to, I had to be the jump master. And like, you go into that mode and you just become it. But um, 
That's great. Yeah, it's like it's it's like the the pitcher for a major league baseball team that has to chew three pieces of bubble gum and like turn around in a circle clockwise twice and turn his hat a certain direction and like he has all these different little uh pre pre-game ritual things he has to do and they they seem so silly and arbitrary but it's just about getting yourself in the zone and it's not that different what you're describing than the mom who gives the kids boo boo a kiss and then it feels better <laughs> <laughs> but that's what these ceremonies you're describing and this dance is about. It's like, you know, it's, a, it's about eliminating the doubt, you know, having that vision of absolute victory or absolute success. I mean, that's kind of what magic is there for in terms of uh, ceremonial magic is to create that shift in consciousness where you have, uh, you, you come closer to absolute certainty that that which it is that you are attempting to achieve is given or guaranteed or is, is reality. And you do that through as many different correspondences and symbolic actions or or uh, implements as you can stack on top of each other. Mm-hmm. Stacking on top of each other. We'll get to that in just one second. But that's it's interesting, and I think it it um, it also it's more than just a mind game. As you correctly note, these these pictures are in black and white because I just took them out of. My most recent book is called Invoking the Ancient Gods in You. And I use this example of the Shango dance. And in, uh, in, um, let me, uh, I wanted to pull this one up. That should, let's put that right there. Then we'll go back. All right. So back to my screen. So in, I am arguing that this, this God, Shango, this deity, this Orisha is associated with Hercules beyond any doubt. I'll prove that. The dance clearly evokes, he's got the ax. We'll talk about the ax because it looks like a sword in the outline, but I'll show you how it's also an ax. But you can find this, it's it's actually a full color dance. You can find this by, uh, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but it's Chongo. At the bottom, I tried to include the, the title, Chongo Dance. They spell it actually on this particular one, Chongo with a C-H. But um, remember how he's, the the priest put the stones on in an inverted mortar. This is what's a mortar? Well, a mortar is a military weapon, but it's a military weapon that's called that because it's from a mortar and pestle. This is a mortar and pestle. This is actually from the region of Equatorial Guinea in Africa. These are pictures of mortars. The, those are a daily um, implement that you would use to mash. You know break up the grain or whatever. If you want to make bread, you've got to turn your grain into flour. Or if you want to make spices, you've got to mash it up. This is a big mortar and pestle. You can see those two women hammering down something with big, huge, the stick is the pestle. The mortar is the big open thing. And the weapon, the military weapon that shoots basically like a high arc cannonball um, used to look like that. It used to look like a big, round pot and you put a cannonball in there and and the idea of a mortar is to shoot it up above the enemy's walls and then drop back down so it's a high angle high trajectory kind of a weapon but it's called that because of the mortar that's a mortar it's kind of a roundish dome looking thing and so they put shango's offerings in an inverted mortar and those initiates who want to become like Shango or become dedicated to Shango, they sit on top of an inverted mortar. Could there be an inverted mortar anywhere near Hercules in the sky? Any kind of a upside down? Oh, there's how you spell Shango. I got my slides a bit out of order. Can you can you see right below Hercules this famous constellation that we talked about last time? I'm not saying it's Ophiuchus, but <laughs> Ophiuchus. It's Ophiuchus. He's an inverted mortar. I mean, I know that may sound like Dave sees Ophiuchus and everything, but Shango is clearly Hercules. I'll show you some more evidence if you don't believe it yet. And, and even the the snake that Ophiuchus holds could be a spear in other you could know, be the, in the middle. Of, and that's yeah. that pestle is like, you know, that that staff shape for sure. Right. But you can see it's inverted and it's it's turned upside down because it's got the the triangular part is on the top. You know, the mortar, the the sealed part of the mortar is at the bottom normally when you're pounding on it. So there's African myths about a mortar 
that have to do with Shango. There's also another African myth that I talk about in Ancient Worldwide System. I didn't put any pictures of it, but I'll just describe it to you where uh, women offend the God, the high God, by their sticks. They're pounding in the mortar and pestle and they poke the God of the sky with their, as you can see, the sticks are pretty long and they're getting vigorous, pounding it down. And they accidentally poke the God of the sky. And so the heavens recede. They, they, they go higher away. It used to be that the gods were down with us. This is what the story is teaching. Gods walked among us, were with us, but then somehow humans pissed them off, in this case, by poking the god of the sky with a pestle while they were pounding out the mortar. And so the heavens receded, the gods went away from us. And so they tried to reach the gods to get back to the god of the sky by putting inverted mortars and stacking them up on top of each other to reach back to the God of the sky. Does this sound like any biblical stories? I'll just plant that seed while I continue to tell. They didn't quite get there. They got almost to the God of the sky and they ran out of mortars for their stack. And so the woman who came up with this idea said, I know what I'll do. I'll take the mortar from the bottom and put it on the top and then we'll reach the God of the sky. Well, of course, when she pulled the mortar out from the bottom, the whole tower collapsed and many people were killed by the tower of collapsing mortars. Does that sound like anything in the Bible? If you had this, if I put a gun to your head and said, what Bible story do people try and reach to the God of the heavens? I believe it's uh, the the book of Jenga chapter three. Yeah. The tower (laughs) of Babel. It's like even the researchers who were writing this down in the 1800s and early 1900s said, this is kind of a tower of Babel story, but they do, it's a tower of mortars. They're trying to reach the God of the heavens with mortars. Well, where does that come from? Look at Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus is a mortar shape upside down, almost reaching to Hercules, the god of the sky. It's actually the god of the Bible, too. I can show that. I do show that in some of my online courses. The tower that they're trying to reach is Ophiuchus. That's what connects us, but in a way, imperfectly. We're not completely connected. We're, it's, a, it's an imperfect connection. It's a tenuous connection, but it's a very interesting myth. The inverted mortar is um, Ophiuchus, I argue. And let me just uh, say also, he's a god of fire. He's right next to the Milky Way. The Milky Way looks like a column of fire, um, the fire coming out of his mouth or the tongue coming out of his mouth. You see that the lower arm of Hercules reaching down towards Ophiuchus? It almost looks like it's coming out of the square-shaped head. Notice how Hercules has a square-shaped head. Shango has a square-shaped head. He has a big, full beard. Most Hercules figures have a big, full beard. We've talked about this before. They also have a tongue coming out of their mouth. I believe that long arm reaching downward could be a big tongue coming out of the head. Can you see that? Oh, yeah, yeah. That makes total sense. It's always like more than one thing at the same time. That's the interesting thing about the star myth. Hmm. Let me just show you why it's an axe. Here's a close-up of the stars of Hercules. You can see the square-shaped head. If you look right in the center of your screen, you'll see the four square stars of the head of Hercules. See there? Yeah. Square-shaped head. Now, Hercules figures will often have a club, and you can see why, but sometimes it is an axe. Thunder gods. Shango carries one. I'll show you another thunder god in a minute who carries one also from... uh, about the same, a uh, different part of the world, but about the same latitudes. Let me take away the stars here. And now I'll show you, these are the four stars that I argue could make the axe head. I'll show them to you without, but you see how that could be an axe? If I connect those four stars and just do a line down the middle, could be an axe. Yep, that makes sense. It could also be, do you know any thunder gods who carry a hammer? Mjolnir comes to mind. <laughs> That's right. So Thor, I don't know if I've shown this on your show before, but Thor is a thunder god who has a big full beard, who, you know, you don't want to make him angry. He's, the characteristics are around the world. He carries a hammer, not an ax, but it's the same stars. I'm going to take away, oh, <laughs> also a lot of times these gods will have a sash with a Palm palm or a tuft at the end. This is the star Vega, which is not far from the hip. But you can see 
this is like a close-up of Hercules. You can see almost a trail of stars going to it. I'll take away the outline in a second. You can see them. The, this, it's almost like there's a trail of stars going off the hip of Hercules going up towards Vega. Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Yep. And then this is also the, the Vajra or the Thunderbolt or, yes. or, you know, all these thunder deities are wielding this, this weapon. Absolutely. I'll just take away the um, outline of the hammer so you can see those four stars that I allege make the um, the outline of the axe or the hammer. Can you see them there? They're pretty bright, actually. Yeah. So the, I'm arguing that Shango with his axe is clearly a Hercules figure. I think that's, you know, I've probably belabored that enough, but I'll, I'll show you. Um, have I shown you chalk before? This is the Maya god chalk. I think we've talked about chalk before yeah. when we did so, uh, a bigger Hercules yeah. episode, but the, you know, the, not everybody is immersing themselves in this material all the time. So the yeah, view is we okay. Won't, we won't spend too long on him, but what's his weapon? Look at, look at what chalk is carrying over his back there. Can you see his weapon? It's an ax. Sometimes yep. it's about chalk. He's a, Rain god, again, these are sky gods, they're thunder gods, they're storm gods, they're associated with Hercules around the world. This is a Maya cup that's in the Met. You can see there's a succession number. You can go to the Met. I don't think they have it out on display, so you probably have to ask. You'd have to write to them in advance and say, hey, I'm trying to come see accession number 1978-412-206. Can you get it out for me or can you take me to see it? But this is from Guatemala or Mexico, 7th or 8th century. And here we have another sky god, clearly in the posture of Hercules. And this time he's carrying an axe just like Shango. So I'm just trying to show some southern um, or more southerly constellations. We'll get to Australia in a second. But these are worldwide. He's clearly got an axe and he's clearly associated with Hercules. I think I've probably shown it before, so we'll just buzz past it. But his outline is absolutely lined up posture wise with hercules the artist has just decided to make his axe going downward instead of upward but look at how he's reaching out and grasping a disc which is right in the position of the arc of the northern crown there but also the other reason i like to show this and brought it out again is if we look closely at chalk's clothing he's got a tuft he's got like a long you know, cloth around his waist that ends in a tuft right around where near pointing towards Vega. It doesn't point exactly to Vega in this artwork, but can you see how he's got that tuft? And you'll see, yeah, you know, artwork of Hercules having the tuft. We won't spend too much time on it because I've talked about this probably on your own program and in a lot of other places, but clearly we're dealing with a worldwide system, but it's not just, it's not just that it's, you know, like I said, a crossword puzzle, an intellectual exercise. Shango, or this god, is inside of you. All these other gods are inside of you. When you talked about doubts or overcoming our doubts, there's actually a whole team of gods and goddesses inside you that are sometimes at odds with one another, just like the gods in the Greek myths are sometimes at odds with each other. That's what I talk about in that book, Invoking the Ancient Gods in You. They're already in you. How that helps us function better in this life is is what the myths are all about. You wanted to see some Southern stuff, so I tried to, you know, bring yeah, that that's, to, that was, show, to that show for great. people. It was great. I, I liked getting to break into some of that myth, and uh, people can check out this gigantic <laughs> volume right here. You know, yeah. we just barely... I've got mine, too. Wait a minute. It's upside down. <laughs> 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 that's awesome do you have anything you want to say to the folks before we let let you go man anything to promote or just closing thoughts yeah well look thanks so much chance for what you're doing for having me on thanks everybody who's you know interested in my work it's this i say my work but really this is our inheritance humanity's inheritance these myths were given to us some people, for their own reasons, want to suppress them or, or stamp them out, but they were given to every culture to uplift us. I'm convinced they're actually very positive and very um, 
necessary or very pertinent to where we are right now. Like all the political things that are happening, this myth stuff may seem a million miles away from it. No, it's not. This is all part of the same. It, this has immediate application to our lives on an individual level and a societal level. And if people want to look more into my work, I have online courses. There's tons of YouTube videos that are free. You can see those. You mentioned my website, Star Myths of the World, which is starmythworld.com. I've got another website, undyingstars.com. They're both linked together. There's links from one to the other, but Undying Stars, I've got various courses you can sign up for. And those are like, li um, not live, they're on-demand videos. I do have a live course that's going, but don't sign up for that one because I'm halfway through it. But in the future, I may have other ones where there's like live discussions with me. But if you, those are a little more expensive, obviously, than the ones where you just buy a course. But the courses are like 12 hours of content for 50 bucks. So, um, you know, and watch it as many times as you want, as fast as you want, as slow as you want. Um, so there's online courses. There's obviously the books. So if you want to get into my work, there's ways to do that for free. There's ways to, you know, go further with some of the products that I put out there. But I really appreciate your platform, what you're doing, what you bring to the discussion and conversation, Chance, your insights and your job of, you know, your podcasting is important. In this circus of political theater, what I've discovered, I think, is really, really important, but I'm not holding my breath for, you know, NPR or the BBC to call me up and say, hey, we want you to tell us about the star myths of the world. The, the media is tightly controlled for a purpose, and that purpose does not include showing the, the illusions that this illusory system of control is based on but that system of control is unraveling and what you're doing is important the internet is enabling voices to be heard that wouldn't otherwise be heard so i appreciate what you're doing thanks for having me on is oh man to say. yeah we got to do it more than uh sooner than a, almost a year i even think i've come to think that what I used to see is adversarial, like uh, censorship and shadow banning and the algorithm not really being so helpful to a show like mine. Now I'm, I'm, I'm taking a different perspective. Like, you know, maybe, the, maybe it's just that these external systems, even um, technological ones are in some way, they're just reflecting the repression that is going on, on the individual psyche. And that maybe like, that's just, this information is just only meant for people who are ready for it and have done some degree of the work to to integrate and and individuate and not be in that rep self repressed state as much. I don't know. I think there could be something to it. I, I have to make peace with like maybe this esoteric stuff doesn't have the 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 reach potential as as if I were just uh, following the circus and and playing in those those rings, but I'm good with it. You know, like everything always shows up to support me and my family, how we need it, when we need it, regardless of what some number says on a, a view count or what have you. So just glad, I'm just glad that there's people like you out there that do such a great bulk of work that I can learn from, I can be inspired from, I can add to in my own constellation of my own heavens, in my own skull to comprehend better the different parts and archetypes of the eternal self that is shared between us all good stuff man look forward thanks to the for next that, one man. thanks for that I yeah dude Real, well said <laughs> cool thanks man we'll, we'll do it again soon man much love likewise like like Chavon says <laughs> Chavon in the story <laughs> see you man <laughs>